Andy. Hello, my friend. How are you? Welcome to Nashville. Oh, wait, you're in Nashville. <laughs> I'm not. No, uh, you're, you're allowed to say welcome to Nashville because I still feel like I'm new here. Uh, so thank you for welcoming me. I How appreciate long it. has it been? Well, it's funny. I, it, I've, it's been a year and a half, but uh, it, people go, well, shouldn't you be acclimated by now? And I say, no, uh, I am me and I am not acclimated yet. It's still <laughs> so, um, there, you know, I hate the word should. One of my favorite authors ever, his name's Brendan Manning. He passed away a few years ago, maybe now. And um, he has this great line about, especially for Christians, but I think it's true of all people, is that we use the word should too much. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, you know, he'd be speaking at churches and he'd throw out this joke, which was like racy at the time. But he said, you know, people, you need to quit shooting all of yourself, mm-hmm. you know. And mm-hmm. so uh, I hate the word should because it's all about regret. So sorry to rant within the first thirty seconds, but well, another uh, should uh, another should yeah. item I have for you is you should change <laughs> the like location information on your Skype handle. Oh, okay, all right. Because that I is will. not updated to your new geographic <laughs> location. There you go. Yeah, I'm not. I don't use Skype very much. I'm a Zoom guy, really? but hmm. I am. Okay, well, fan. we're gonna we're gonna dive into that and. All right, we'll talk about Zoom. All right. Big, um, Zoom. So let me, I'm just going to read your bio for folks who don't already know and kind of follow all the cool stuff you do. For everyone. That would be everyone. But go ahead. That's fine. Andy Traub was born, you were born in Indiana? I was. I was like, how is this wrong already? (laughs) Four words in and I screwed up my bio. Yeah, I was born in Indiana. Okay. um, I guess you wrote your your bio accurately. I I was just doubting it from the outset. I don't have people to write my bio. And Andy Drop was born in Indiana, but now lives south of Nashville, Tennessee. He has a love for creating spoken content, which means that his writing style is characterized by a conversational tone and an ability to be vulnerable with purpose. That's a cool phrase, vulnerable with purpose. Thanks. Readers also enjoy multiple layers when experiencing his books. He embeds his own audio content directly into his books, allowing readers to truly hear the author's voice. And the author is Andy. Most of his books also have a corresponding podcast show available for free on iTunes. Traub is proud of his writing and his work creating many podcasts. With Seth Godin's permission, he started the unofficial Lynchpin podcast in 2011 and has interviewed dozens of thought leaders on that particular show. In general, his shows are often praised because of the unique and challenging questions he asks his guests. He is also an Evernote expert, a TEDx speaker, and one of the most helpful guys online. When he's not writing books or recording interviews, you can find him at home playing with his three young children or taking his wife on a date on date night. Was it three or four years ago that Forbes wrote an article on you talking about sort of how you got your family out of this $15,000 of debt, taking matters into your yeah. own hands, writing an yeah. ebook that became successful, yeah. and then that sort of jump-starting your, your journey as an entrepreneur. So can you kind of tell us that story in, in your yeah. words? Just why, why are you here today, Andy, standing at your stand-up desk in Nashville? I am, I am standing at my stand-up desk uh, because of your generosity. Oh. And your faith in me. Well, so thank not, you for that. That's not the right uh, answer. Specifically right here. But uh, going back to that moment, I was actually, I was doing some podcasting and I um, interviewed Jeff Goins, who lives um, about 15 minutes from here. And he's at GoinsWriter.com. And uh, I, I wanted to, <laughs> I basically heard him moderate a call. I was a student in his course. And I called him. I said, hey, um, can I help you with that? Because hmm. yeah, you didn't do very well. <laughs> like you, you seemed overwhelmed, wow. you know? And okay. it's like, because I was really overwhelmed. <laughs> so I said, all right, well, I, I specialize in helping moderate calls and webinars, things like that. So can I, just, can I help you? And we'll, we'll talk about payment later. But I would, you know, you have a huge platform. I'd love to help. And so uh, through that course, I was moderating calls, but I wasn't actually doing the course. <laughs> I'd stopped doing the coursework, uh, which is called Tribe Writers. And it helps you, you know, finish your book and build a tribe. But I kind of got tired of talking about it without doing it. I felt pretty hypocritical. Hmm. And so I was like, okay, I'm going I'm to finish something. At the time, I was hosting uh, a podcast with a guy named Andy Andrews. And uh, he, and, that, and the reason I got that gig is I reached out to them and said, Andy needs a podcast. And they said, we agree, but how can you help us? And I said, I'll host it for free, which I did for a long time. And that was massive exposure. But I'm, I'm helping Andy and 
And I said, hey, Andy, I'm reading one of your books. And I just um, saw the section about getting up early. I think that we should do a 30 email um, in a row, a daily thing for folks that just sort of train them to get up early. And they said, that's a great idea, Andy Traub. Why don't you do it and not Andy Andrews? And I was like, hmm. can I keep the email subscribers? And they're like, sure, you're going to basically do everything. <laughs> so I talked about it on his show. And then I had these 30 emails. And then I started helping Jeff. And I felt like I needed to write a book, but I didn't really want to write a book because he wants to sit down and write 300 pages or something. I'm not that smart. And I thought, what do I have that's like book worthy? And I thought, I have these 30 emails. So I took those 30 emails and I fleshed them out, made them longer. And then I wrote about 30 or 40 pages to begin the book. And they were all about building the habit of getting up early. And I published it. And because I knew a few people that were very kind and generous uh, and, and blurbed about the book and talked about the book, and in addition, I also just started to practice what they preach about being generous. And I started to say, hey, if you sign up, I'll give you the book for free. Not, not a chapter, not two chapters, uh, the whole thing when it's done. And I, and I started to get, I think I ended up with about 700 people. And then when the book came out in electronic format, I just I sent it to, to those people in Kindle and PDF. I might have sent them in Word, I don't know, everything. And then I started to sell it and it, it started to do really well. And something... Um, a huge mistake I made is I, I left it only in, in Kindle format for like a year and I could have sold a lot more. Versus but, not in PDF, you're saying? Or versus um, audio? Well, what I did is when I sold it, I eventually finished the book, put it on Amazon, and I didn't print it out so you could actually oh, print it. Print, oh, you're saying print, versus yeah, print. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, th- I'm just trying to make sure people realize that I make huge mistakes. So uh, that was a huge mistake. I prob- that was probably a $15,000, maybe $20,000 mistake, which is a big mistake wah, to me. Wah. Yeah, wah, wah, times 20000 Um, And so uh, other people started to talk about it. Uh, a friend, she, she lives here now too, uh, about 15 minutes away, 20 minutes. It was Crystal Payne from MoneySavingMom.com. Mm-hmm. She did a 30-day challenge on the book, so she walked through the book for 30 days. Uh, and again, it was kind of a friend-of-a-friend conversation. And then... Uh, I just started to sell a bunch of them. I just gained steam and uh, I priced it right. And um, by price it right, I mean I didn't price it cheap. I think it was like seven ninety nine, which by then was a lot for an ebook, especially for a first time author. And th- I just sold enough that we got our family out of debt. Um, that's really that's really the story. And then I went on Dave Ramsey's show. Uh, by then I had met John Acuff, who's a friend, and he had a new book coming out. And I know enough about promotion that I called Dave's people and I said, listen, we're debt free. We just became debt free. I know John has a new book coming out. I, I've never told this story publicly, by the way. <laughs> those, those calls are not uh, unplanned. They're very, very planned uh, when you hear the Dave Ramsey debt free scream. Uh, and so I said, hey, I would love to talk about how John influenced me. We can, that way you can plug his new book and, you know, and then talk about Dave, of course, as well. And I'll just happen and I'll mention my book. Well, when I mentioned my book and how much I had sold, Dave said, hey, I used to sell books out of the you know, trunk of my car mm-hmm. and I'd give my right leg to be able to sell that many, of, you know, mm-hmm. make that much. How did you do that? And at one point he goes, man, let's sell some more of your book. Well, Dave Ramsey has, I mean, I don't know, three million listeners, four million listeners. Um, so I didn't sell like a million books but um, because a lot of his listeners are cheap. But uh, – <laughs> they are. They wouldn't buy an $8 ebook. <laughs> so I, I ended up selling a lot. And then, um, yeah, I got picked up in Forbes. And um, and that's how they told told my story of writing a book to get out of debt. And it just really put me on a trajectory uh, of, um, of success that we were able to move, uh, afford to move, have the freedom to move. And we moved about a year and a half ago uh, to just south of Nashville. Wow. I did not know the Dave Ramsey part. I didn't understand that you sold books also on the Dave Ramsey show. So that was you. Yeah, that, you that was another. In and call, you called in and did the debt free stream on his show and then yeah. separately. That's really awesome. Yeah. So that was another. <clears throat> that was that was that was like the comeback. You know, it was like kind of died down. I'd made my money. Um. And again, it was just being strategic. It was just saying, "Hey, I want to help John, and we can talk about his book." And because it, it just, you know, and I, and it was funny I, when I listened because I was like, you know, I recorded what I, the call, <laughs> I kind of insulted Dave, like, because I said, "Hey, Dave, no offense to you, but like John's been a huge help to me." 
which was really not a good choice of words. I could, you know, like anyway, it was just I would not have said it that way if I would have thought it through. But I don't think a lot of things through. I just do stuff. <clears throat> so anyway. Okay, so now talk to me about, okay, so then you start seeing all this success and with success yeah. starts coming opportunities and overwhelm. Well, people want to know how do you do that with your book? So I'll, I made a self-publishing course on how to do that with your ebook. And uh, one of the unique things I did is I did embed the audio. In, so if you get the Kindle on every page, you can click on it, unless you're on like a Kindle Paperwhite. If you're on an internet-connected device and you're reading the Kindle version, Every chapter at the beginning, you can click a link and listen to me read the chapter. Hmm. And then when you buy the book, because uh, they're short chapters, you know, um, uh, when you buy the book, you get an opportunity to sign up for 30 days of email, just like those other people did originally with the Andy Andrews thing. Uh, and, and most people have not read the book. Most people sign up for the email. And then for the next 30 days, every morning, they'd open their phone. And they'd cl- and they wouldn't even they wouldn't even even though I, I I'm I'm emailing them Claire I'm emailing them each chapter for thirty days again very short, mm-hmm. but at the beginning of each email is a link to listen to me read that day's, you know instruction. So people would buy the book whether digital or print, they would not read the book. They may not read the, f- the first section, but that thirty days, which is a majority of the book, most of them would get an email every day for thirty days and then listen to me read it. So mm. and I none of that was like hey. You know, be really strategic and smart is if I collected email addresses by blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I just, I actually did it because I was pissed because um, I get so mad about how expensive audiobooks are. It was sort of like me flipping off the system and being like, you know what, system? I'm, I'm not going to do your Audible $38, you know, uh, purchase. I'm actually just going to give my audiobook included for free. And so when you bought the book, you got the 30 days email. You also got the whole book on audio for free. And I literally did that, Claire. I did that. You can still do it today. You can still see it today. But um, I, I literally just have a link to Dropbox. I have a Dropbox folder on my computer. And people can just go and, and I think they can get the PDF of the book. And they can get the audio book. And you can just, that's all it is. It's just a Dropbox folder. There's nothing fancy. Like It's a, a link to a link. And it sits here on my hard drive. So if I deleted it, like people would start emailing me like, dude, you said you were going to give me your book free. But uh, I did things, and that cost me like nothing. I mean, it's just, you know, it, and well, I just sort of it got. It cost you your time. I mean, you know how oh, yeah, to do yeah, this stuff yeah. in ways that other people don't. Yeah, yeah, I do. So how do. how did you learn to be, you know, smart at the <clears throat> interwebs, smart at the tools that make the interwebs run? Well, let me just frame this. Am I allowed to ask how old you are? Is yeah. that offensive? I'm 34 okay. as of All as right. of the time of this recording. As of the time, okay, all right. I'm 38. I don't know when your birthday is, but happy birthday. January. Okay. No, no, I was just saying that. Correctly. Oh, yeah, because this will live forever. <laughs> right. People listen to podcasts. Yeah, all right. My favorite Seth Godin interview is from December of 2014. People are like, when is that? And I go, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, I lost track. You uh, asked how old I was. I, I, I asked, asked what made oh, you okay, good at right. tools. I want, I want people to understand, like, they did like I was not raised on the internet. Like hmm. I was raised like I think in college I got a computer my freshman year and it, it definitely did not connect to the internet. Mm-hmm. Like I remember standing in line in college to check my email. Okay. Why would you do that? Because you don't have email on your phone because computers were not everywhere. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I'm just saying like, I, here, here's what I'm really getting at. I get very frustrated when people say, well, I'm just not good with computers. Hmm. I'm not a techie. I'm too old. Hmm. Listen, it's not that complicated. Like The reason they call it like a word processor is because it's like typing on a typewriter. right? Hmm. Like it, So many people are like, oh, I'm just not good at tech. Hmm. I'm going to call bull. I'm going to say that your attitude is getting in the way of your aptitude. <laughs> like, I can't do it. Well, then you're much less likely to do it. You, you know, it sounds like my six-year-old. It's like, I can't get off the couch. <laughs> right, because your attitude sucks. That's why you can't get off the couch. So I want to say this. How did I get good at tech? I just started to play with it. I started to try it. And I am really good at a couple things. And one of them is quitting. I probably quit things too much. But I try things and I'll try something else. Like I'm not, other than to my wife uh, and to the Lord, I'm not very loyal. Like I'll just kind of bounce around stuff. Like business idea, great for six months, I'm moving on. Where I live, 
I'm not loyal. Like, hmm. you know, I'll just, I'll just move around. And technology, like I just switched from iOS for my phone to an Android phone. And people are like, why do you do that? Wow. I, really, I like Andy? That's big it, news. It is big news. And what's funny is some people are like, Ooh. did anybody give me any crap for that? And I was like, no, because they know that I know my tech. And I thought about it. Hmm. So I got good at tech because I tried stuff. And if I didn't get it, I would try something else. I'm constantly trying things. And that's what I think is the myth. People think that people who are really good at something are like, oh, they're just really good at that. And I go, well, maybe they're really good at that one because they just kept trying things until they found the one that fit them. Hmm. Right. And hmm. so I like to try things until they fit me. Like, like I am a horrible ice skater. So guess what? You'll never see me do the rest of my life. And I haven't done since I was like seven. Professional Put on ice skating. skates. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I respect you. Great. The sharp blade on ice. Great. But like ice is cold and it hurts when you fall on it. So I'm out. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so how do you get, how did I get good at tech? I experimented. I tried things and I keep doing that and it works. So do you think in the beginning, like when you were 22 and first getting your first email yeah. address, because yep. I'm, I'm yep. I was about 18, so I'm guessing you yep. were about 22. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. In the beginning, were we overwhelmed by this stuff or, or not? Like, why are we overwhelmed I, now? I think we're overwhelmed because there's 17 kinds of butter at the supermarket. Okay. And by that, I mean, it's like, well, you should just get an email uh, program. Well, when I was 18, there was like one email program. It was like Microsoft Outlook. Right. Maybe the Apple had one. Now there's 37, you know, different options. And so I think that part of it's overwhelming. Everybody says, here's why you should do this one, and you should, and you should, and you should. Again, don't, don't should. But um, I think in the beginning, it was difficult. Technology was difficult because we literally couldn't get our heads around it. I mean, it's still kind of hard to get your head around it. Like, I, there's this great thing, you can look it up on YouTube, of um, Steve Jobs, and he picks up a laptop, mm-hmm. he unplugs it, and he takes a hula hoop. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is like, it wasn't like an Apple hula hoop. Like, um, somebody had to go to the store and buy a hula hoop, and he takes it and he puts it around the computer, basically saying, like, there's no wires, right? And people go ballistic. And it's like, like clamshell <laughs> laptop. Literally there's looks no like a wires. Clam- yeah, and he does like a hula hoop, you know, like the magician, uh, you know, says there's no wires hanging around here. And, and it blew people away because he was showing off the wireless internet. Wow. And my point is, then it was like mind-blowing. Oh, how did, what is this magical thing, right? And I'm, I'm with him. Like, I, I don't know where I was, but I remember like being on Wi-Fi and being like, this is magical. Hmm. Like, this is voodoo, but I like it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think we went from I didn't really understand it to now we understand it and we're overwhelmed by the possibility of it. So before it was like, that's amazing. There's a website I can go buy used goods from other people, eBay. Now it's, gosh, I should be making money on eBay. Hmm. Why don't I maximize this? Hmm. So now we're pissed at ourselves because we don't maximize everything. Before we just kind of didn't get it. But now it's like we're just hard on ourselves. Like we really just go, I should just get so much more done and be so much more productive Mm. and I should make money these 18 different ways because we just have – and the 17 kinds of butter is – that reference is when my wife sends me to the store and she says get some butter and I stand in front of the butter section literally and I look at it and I go, are you freaking kidding me that there are 17 kinds of butter? Because that's 16 opportunities for this husband to get it wrong and usually I do. All right. right. So it, the, we're overwhelmed by choices, and we think, I'm going to do it wrong. I was telling a friend this just yesterday. I have a, a bookshelf over here to my right, and uh, what fear tells me, I write a lot about fear. What fear tells me is that every day I'm failing because I'm not reading every single one of those books. Everyone's an opportunity, right? But the reality, which is true, fear always has a little bit of truth in it, and then it wraps in a big fat lie. Hmm. Right, so the truth is I do have a lot of options. I do have a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of great books I need to finish over here. But the reality is instead of looking at it like you know, uh, 200 missed opportunities, I need to look at it like a case of donuts. Because no one looks at a case of donuts and says, I f- I'm going to fail. I am going to fail by purchasing this, this donut because I didn't eat all of them. Hmm. No, you just go, look at all the great choices I have. I'm going to pick one. I'm going to enjoy it. And then I'm going to come back tomorrow and pick another donut. Right. Mm. But instead, fear tells us, you know, us creatives, like you should be doing more. And maybe it's just not just creatives, but it's people who's like, you should be more productive. You should. It's like, no, maybe you have amazing tools. Get done when you need to get done. Then put it in airplane mode or shut it off 
because otherwise your brain is wired to stay connected to it and then go be with your kids, right? Like that's my reality that I, I battle every single day. And so how good are you at shutting it off? Uh, in the last few weeks, I've sucked because I got a new phone and I love it and it's fun. And my wife said to me yesterday, we sat down, just had a conversation right over my shoulder here in my office. And she just like, you know, you're on your phone too much lately. And I was like, mm-hmm. you know what? You're right. So, so check it out. I'm going to geek out for a minute. Android has a thing called NFC, which is near field communication. Don't overcomplicate it. It just means when things are close, near, right, that they can communicate with it, right? And, and iPhones don't have this. But um, uh, th- my phone, I have these little chips, the little uh, actually stickers, and they have a little chip embedded in them. Just think of like, you know, a little sticker you get from your dentist or whatever for, you know, for going to the dentist. Uh, the inside of them have a little chip. And I'm going to put one in my car. I'm going to put one at home. And basically, when I tap my phone to that chip, it will do certain things on my phone. Like in my car, I'll put it uh, where, I, where, I, where I set my phone in my car. And when I do that, my phone will turn on Spotify or turn on Pocket Cast, my, my, you know, and, and it'll put it mm-hmm. probably in airplane mode. It'll, it'll make my phone do things. Mm-hmm. So the way I'm going to get better at my boundaries is I'm going to put a, a sticker right inside my door. I'll hide it, obviously. But uh, I'll tap my phone to it, and I'll put my phone in, like, airplane mode. Wow. Right? Now I can take it out of airplane mode, sure, right? Sure, sure. But that's the way I'm geeking out. I'm, like, I'm using tech to get off of tech, wow. right? Wow. So that's NFC. Those are called uh, NFC tags. That's what they're called. You can buy them, like, in a 10-pack or whatever. So I want to totally geek out about that. So when, I, when I'm here at my desk, I'm, I'll have, I have this little stand. I don't know if we're doing video, but you can see me. Mm-hmm. This little stand where I set my phone, mm-hmm. right? And on the stand, I'll put a different sticker, right? And maybe at my other desk, I might have another stand with a different sticker. And they all do different things. So you don't have to go understand NFC and get stickers for your phone. The point is I use technology to stay away from technology where I um, am addicted to the internet like every other American. And so I have to use a program. Oh, which one is it? It's the one that blocks your ability to be on the internet. I don't know which one it's called. Rescue But there's, there's... Rescue Time has that option, but I don't know. If Rescue Time is one. Um, anyway, there's, there's a couple others. Um, it has a non-techie name. But I, I have one where literally you click it and you say, I want to be offline for 30 minutes. You cannot get back online unless you power down your computer and turn it back on within 30 minutes. That's amazing. Otherwise, you have to wait 30 minutes. It, for, it forces you to be offline for that amount of time. Okay, so there's how no much... Way- Okay, so how much time in a given day are you trying to spend offline? Man, I, that's too good of a question. It makes me too uncomfortable. Yeah, no, I'm okay. kidding. Okay. Uh, no, it's a, no, it's a great question. Push through it, uh, push through it. Sure. Uh, you're cheaper than my counselor. This is good. Um, let's see. How much am I trying to? I mean, I'll just do the math. Like, uh, if I start it. Seven. I try to read before I start going. I write, and so I don't need to be online for that. I mean, I'm probably online for six, seven hours a day. Okay. And then after that, I try to not be on. I'm not probably, probably, I'm probably on for eight or nine. I'm probably now. I'd say eight hours a day. I'm on like an hour at night, and then um, you know, probably six or seven hours during the day, just of, of work time. And then the idea is when you finish your work day, what do you do with your phone? Um, I try to put it somewhere else. I just have sucked at it lately because I started doing Snapchat and that's addictive. And um, I really like my new phone. Like, hmm. like they don't make these things so you put them down, right? Like hmm. let's remember that. Like <laughs> they don't make your phone, your, your computer so you don't want to use it. Right. right? They, they make these things so that you are more involved. When you're the product, Right then like which we are if you use facebook or any social media for that matter like linkedin like you're the product so they want you to be on it more they want to be more useful uh so that you stick with them because the more you're on it the more data you're giving them and the more they can sell ads which you know Mm -hmm. god bless them like that's that's how (laughs) that's how business works Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. um so I, i battle with it because again i'm not real hard on myself but like i i'm because i have an enemy and the enemy is like I'm the product. I'm the. I'm. I'm They're marketing to me. So, it's a battle. It's it's been a battle, but I would say the thing that makes it uh, more real to me is I have kids who will look at me and say, literally, my children will say, "Dad, put your phone down." 
dad, you're on your phone too much. And wow. like that, that stings, you know, like they're not being a nag, <laughs> right? Um, they, they're just, they just miss their dad. You know what I mean? So I, my daughter's too. And so just about six months ago or four months ago, we, we went through the whole, you know, she discovered the iPad exists and, yeah, and yeah. became, you know, started to become addicted to the iPad and, you know, this whole sort of dilemma. And it was really a wake up call because it was obviously something I've read all these, you know, articles about on <laughs> or books, yeah. but then watching it happen and watching that, you know, me saying, okay, you can use the iPad for half an hour every night to watch Peppa Pig, right? Yeah. But oh, then, you got a Peppa Pig fan too? Oh, yeah. Peppa Pig oh, is, yeah. is coming to Buenos Aires. I guess they're doing some show or something. I mean, maybe, I don't know. Of course Peppa they Pig are. Is coming. What does that mean? And so we're going. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> um, but, you know, she's obsessed with Peppa Pig. And yeah. I realized, you know, me saying, you can only be on it for half an hour a night. To me, that feels like this incredibly generous. I'm giving you 30 minutes of iPad time. You should, you, the two-year-old right. who has no right, logic, right. should be yeah, thrilled. Right. But yeah, in reality, I mean, I'm on the phone all the time. Do you know what I mean? Oh, and so it was fair. a my huge kids say to me, learning. My kids say to me, Dad, it's not fair. You get to be on the computer and talk to your friends all oh, day. Okay, right. So, so this right here, okay, so they're like, Dad, that's totally not fair. Because right. like you get to talk to your friend in Argentina. Right. For work. And you're like, we only get 30 minutes of this or that. Right. And I'm like, mm. wow. like, but here's what I go. Daddy makes money using the internet. Like mm -hmm. you're just watching Peppa the Pig. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I win. You know, mm -hmm. but there there is some truth to what they say. Is it I, called I, Peppa the Pig in English? I don't know. That's probably Peppa Pig. I'm probably saying it wrong. Well, so no, I don't know because no I disrespect to all the Peppa Pig fans. I probably don't even know what it's actually. You called. know, it's funny. Uh, speaking of Argentina and Peppa Pig, does your daughter listen to them in Spanish or English? Both, because it's because, on television in Spanish, but then right. the YouTube. So so does my English. daughter because oh, really? she just she doesn't care. <laughs> what the language is she's listening to him in german i just she's got kids youtube app and she's looking through and i'm like lucy that's that's in spanish she's like looks at me like what's spanish it's peppa pig dad i don't care what language it is so anyway peppa pig is breaking all cultural barriers down oh that's amazing so, okay, yes it is so what would you say to yourself Aside from, you know, getting an I Android talk to myself phone a lot. So getting, this is not aside from getting an Android phone and getting the sticker <clears throat> thing, which sounds complicated, yeah. to yes, try it, it to is. get yourself offline more. Because I like this idea that we can <clears throat> contain our digital overwhelm by actually stepping yeah. away from it. Oh, absolutely. L listen, listen. Uh, physiological, which like we'll get to the root of that. Physical, like I cut my finger big time. It actually looks really gross today. Um, it's healed, right? But the scar is just going to be gross for a while. But like physiological, like people go, I cut my finger. Okay, that's a physical change. When you turn off your phone, there is a physical change to your brain. I'm not a neurological scientist. I just read books. Mm -hmm. And there are people who have done these studies that physically your brain does different things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you turn your phone off. And I challenge everyone listening to simply do this. Hmm. Right? Just do this. When you have lunch, when you get home, whatever it might be, physically hold down the power button. You haven't done this in a long time. I know. Hold it down for like five seconds. It'll say, do you want to power off? And you say, yes, power it off and pay attention to physically how you feel. You will physically feel different. When you lay your phone next to your bed, put your phone in airplane mode, you will physically feel different. If you power your phone all the way down, you will also, it is a, it is the difference between tense, anticipation, you know, uh, something going to run around. I mean, think of this, like if, if there was a Jaguar loose in your neighborhood and you happen to be like out and about, and of course you'd get an update on your phone about it, you would, you would be different. You would be more aware, right? Mm. We are like that all the time. We are always aware. Why? Because we're ready for the next call, notification, update, whatever it might be. So when you turn your device all the way off, whether it's airplane mode or all the way off, all the way off, all the way off, uh, like the annoying stewardesses say, you know, turn it all the way off, all the way off, right? Um, you know, we, they're annoying us because we don't like how it feels. Hmm. And so, how, you know, that is how I uh, encourage people is don't, don't play, pl play with fire. Just turn it all the way off. And, but pay attention because it's not like, and in 12 months you'll feel better. Like physically, you will be more present with your children. Uh, emotionally, you will be more present with your spouse. Spiritually, you'll be more connected if you're in church, right? Like I'm in church, I turn off 
I put it in airplane mode and I open Evernote and I'm taking notes. I feel different because I know I'm not going to get interrupted by a notification. Hmm. Right? Hmm. That's what I would tell people to do. And you need to do that on a very regular basis. You get very comfortable with the airplane mode shortcut, which there is a lot of easy ways to get to that shortcut now and whatever your operating system is. For iOS, swipe up from the bottom. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Wow. Andy, you rock. So, Andy, Thanks. tell us where people can find you and tell us what you're yeah. working on now. I'm working on a lot of stuff, and I'm totally pumped about that. So one of the lessons Gary Vee taught me is don't be an expert until you've done something. Hmm. So he says, the reason I can sit up here and yell at you about doing business better is he said, because I've actually built businesses. Hmm. Don't trust people unless they actually built a business, right? So a 24-year-old who's a life coach should not be coaching people that are 64, okay. right? Because like they don't have enough life yet, you know? yeah. Now, that's not always true, but like usually it's like you don't coach what you haven't done, right? right? So like I'm not a very good soccer coach. Why? Because I'm not great at soccer. But thankfully, there's six and seven-year-olds, so I pull it off. <laughs> so um, this is very fresh in my mind. Um, so just be one step ahead. Just one step. Just be ahead. one step ahead. So like when I was a when I was a, a a teacher, I would always be like literally four pages ahead, and if they ask a question beyond that, I go whoa whoa whoa. <laughs> The learning process, you got to just take it one step at a time. And I haven't read that section, right? Um, hey, I totally forgot what I was saying. I got off track. I was yeah, asking uh, what you're working find. on now. Okay. So I'm working on a ton of stuff. And Gary Vee taught me this. Like, I've always had this tension between I love technology and I love just inspire people, right? And his thing is like he inspires people and he coaches people and he's a thought leader, but he also has a business. So my business is digihowto.com, D-I-G-I, howto.com. And then my thought leadership stuff is takepermission.com. Now, I break a lot of rules. You're not supposed to have two blogs. I don't update them often enough. Blah, 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 blah. Regret, regret. Should, should, should. But um, I have two things. Like, I am this guy who loves technology. Love technology. And I also have this thought leadership thing. And what Gary Vee taught me is like, Andy, it's okay to have two things. Um, and so the reason I can talk about take permission is because I moved my family a thousand miles. Right. And the reason I can talk about, you know, the best, you know, video conferencing app is because I'm a geek. I'm a geek. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's Digi How To and Take Permission. I'm writing. I just finished a book. It's 10,000 words. Uh, so it's a small book, but it's a, you know, we'll, we'll put a lot of white space in it uh, called What Fear Says. And oh, it's about really? Paris. Yeah. So I'm doing a series of What Fear Says. And the first one is I think fear talks about about five or six topics. Yeah. But one of them is comparison. So one of the wow. things is. Why would I listen to your podcast when I can listen to another podcast? Uh, That's what fear will fear will say to you, Claire. Why would they listen to me when they could listen to so and so? Yeah. Fear will say, Why would they buy from me when they could buy from them? Right. right. So that's comparison, right? Uh, and so I have basically eight sentences that fear says, maybe ten, and then I I write about uh, that idea and and why there's always a little truth in it and the rest of it's wrapped in a big fat lie. So what fear says. Um, uh, and I think on whatfearsays.com. Mm -hmm. so I'll redirect that. Uh, I am doing a course on um, content creation system. So I, I teach people how to use Evernote to capture all of your ideas, to gather them, to grow them. So you revisit them and then you send them. You know, you, you, uh, you gain traction with them by posting them, whether it's a course or a podcast or your book or whatever it might be. Um, and so that's going to come out the next seven or eight days um, and that's the content creation system um, I have an Ever Evernote course I still create uh, I'm uh, in charge of a Rainmaker platform uh, Facebook page which is a, a basically a website platform um, so I'm a part of a 48 days uh, mastermind with Dan Miller uh, folks don't know who he is you can look him up and I'll probably write another early to rise book I just did a reader survey and so many people found out about me through that, and I really have missed the boat. Like, that should have been chicken soup for the soul for me. Mm. You know, I should have sold billions, but I just stopped. Uh, people are really hungry for that, and I'm going to do, I think, an early to rise for dads um, and just really target it for dads to, to build the habit of getting up early. That's awesome, Andy. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for being here, and have, have a great week. Bless you, my friend. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thanks.